Greetings, my friends around the world. Who and what is God? Well, seemingly funny question. We all know who and what is God, don't we? We are all convinced that we know that we serve the true God, the one who created us. You know, everyone knows his name, observed one wise man speaking about God, but no one seems to know him. True words, those, and ironic words, too. For in a modern world packed with Bible of every translation and description, computer, millions, and even having the word of God on have indeed heard God's name, but precious few seem to know much about the living God. What a pity. But we need not, we must not remain in ignorance of this absolutely foundational principle of Christianity. We simply must know who the real God is and what he is like. So what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible clearly reveals God's nature to those who will listen and believe. God is the eternal supreme creator. He is one God, but at present a family of two beings, the Father and Son, who are alike as the loving, kind, merciful rulers of all reality and who have opened their family to all those humans who will be saved. The usual teachings of this world, of course, are diametrically opposite to what the Bible says. The religionists of this world, of course, would not quickly agree with this definition that I've just posted to you. The non-Christian world has images of God or of gods that cover virtually every possible or rather impossible conception. Some view God as an animal-like creature or as the sun or like a man but with six arms. Others think God is everywhere, meaning he is in water or sand or the wind. Still others think of him only as a force, a great beginning power that has no personality, form or shape. Even Christians argue among themselves. Usually, though, in Christian circles, believers think God is a trinity, a three-in-one God that they admit is a, as they say, mystery. Further, they believe that this trinity is closed, that none shall ever enter within this sacred triumvirat of God's realm. Some, especially those who fancy themselves as cosmopolitan and educated, don't believe God exists at all, or if he did, that he is now dead. Now, which, if, if any, of these ideas is correct? <laughs> well, as you can well say, as you can, you, you can well suppose, none. The Bible teachings, well, the Bible teachings about God are, seems to be a total mystery to this world. Probably the place to begin is with God's composition. We, of course, are human, that is mortal and made of the elements. It is not so with God, for scripture plainly says that God is a spirit, John chapter 4, verse 24. We know from other verses that beings composed of spirit, including angels, for example, are on a higher level of existence than, than we, and that such spirit is not limited by the physical laws of nature to which humans are bound. We read about that in John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8, and in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 12. But although composed of spirit like the angels, God is not a mere angel. No, no, no. He is in a class, quite literally, by himself. Please notice Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. And not only is God in a class by himself, but he is higher in rank than all other things, since he is the creator of all things, and it follows that the creator is above the creation. Now notice this very point made by the, made by the author of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. He who built the house has more honor than the house, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. So time and again, God confirms he is the only God and a God above all else. Like in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 5, I am the Lord and there is no other, there is no God beside me. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 11, I am the Alpha and Omega and the Omega the first and the last. So besides being in a spirit, the only God and above all else, we find that God is both eternal, meaning having no beginning or ending, and also immortal, that he will live forever. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, God is called eternal. And that's my preferred uh, title of him, and I usually call him eternal, because that really does 
define his nature. But also in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 39 through 40, we read the following. Now see that I, even I am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. For I lift my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever. Now, of course, it is natural for humans to want to see God, or, if we cannot, to at least know what He looks like. Unless we can see at least a mental image of God, we cannot feel we know Him. Yet Scripture, contrary to the beliefs of many, says plainly and pointedly that no one has seen God at any time. This is in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 18. So clearly, the prospect of seeing God in the flesh is non-existent. But we are not left in darkness, for the very one who said no one has seen God, the Apostle John, also said in the same verse that the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He, Jesus Christ, has declared Him. Now one way Jesus declared the Father was through Jesus' very presence on earth as a visible person. In response to Philip's request that He show us the Father, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 8 and 9, Have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Now we know from this verse and many others, such as Genesis 1.27, that the Father resembles human form, although he, like Jesus Christ, pictured in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, is glorified in flaming brilliance with air white as snow, eyes like a flame of fire, with feet like fine brass and if refined in a furnace, and his face like the sun shining in its strength. Well, of course that God is no rock or fish. He is no washed out, pale stone statue dead on an altar, without any life whatsoever except for moss clinging to it through the centuries. He is like the sun while retaining the general features found in humans. Yet, such powerful, brilliant, eternal, immortal, omnipotent being would be but a terror to us, if, to us all, if such a one were evil and wicked, a spiritual despot who wrecked havoc through the universe and only made humans to torment or to provide entertainment for his own fiendish schemes. But our God is no such a God. No, he is the very opposite of that worrisome picture, So much so that John, unable to find stronger words to describe God's goodness, says merely, God is love, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Love then, and love as an outgoing concern for others, is God's greatest single attribute, His greatest quality. Yet it is not God's only character quality, for as the Bible shows, He is also full of joy, peace, long-suffering, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruits of His Spirit, as are delineated in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. And even that is not all, for it would require many more past pages to quote verse after verse describing all God's attributes, God's loving forgiveness and mercy, His power, His zeal, His eternal, positive, immortal, immutable, unstoppable greatness. Yes, friends, our God is a good God, filled only with a desire to do good for us. He would never hurt us. No, He would die before He hurt you, and in fact, He has. Read about it in John chapter 3, verse 16. In the face of such great news about God, it is hard to imagine what could be said further. But the best is yet to come. And that best is this. God is a family. A family you can enter as a full member and child. The fact that God is his family should not have eluded so many professing Christians for so long. The scriptures abound with references to God of the Father and God of the Son. Yet most have simply chosen the plain meaning of these verses and instead interpret such words as merely symbolic. A great block to understanding that God is a family is found in the common misconceptions about the Holy Spirit, misnamed Holy Ghost, being a person. Such a non-biblical belief must be handled in detail elsewhere, but suffice it to say that such a belief chokes out the truth about 
the God family by adding a third person to the Godhead who has no assigned role as father or son and hence does not fit in fit the family scheme and thus diverts one's understanding from it as it is revealed in the Bible and also creates the familiar closed trinity that so many Christians believe in. Such a belief contradicts the greatest truth of God that you and I can enter the God family as full members on the God level and thus very God ourselves under the authority of the Father and Son. This incredible truth is plain. It is the plain teaching of God's word in John 1 verse 11 and verse 12 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 and 18 in Galatians chapter 4 verses 5 through 7 in Romans chapter 8 verse 14 through 17 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 35 through 55 and the gospel of John chapter 17 verse 20 through 26 although this is a large subject it helps comprehension to remember or even memorize a few key verses John 4:24 shows God is a spirit being Isaiah 45.5 shows God is the only God. John 1.18 reveals that no one has seen God, but that the, the Son has declared Him. Revelation 1 verses 13 through 16 describes God's glorified body that shines with tremendous brilliance. John chapter 1 verse 11 and 12 conveys the astounding truth that we can enter the God family. In conclusion, friends, yes, this world knows God's name, but does not know Him. But those who will hear and believe the simple but exciting truth that, you know, flood from his word can know both his name and who and what he is. In one plain and simple definition, dear friends, God is a family, a family that can receive an innumerable number of new members. That is actually the plan of salvation for all humankind. That's actually the greatest mystery. It seems that this tragic world, which is coming to an end very soon, has never understood. Until next time, be excited friends. We were all born with the same destiny to become God's children, to become God ourselves so that we can, under God's authority, populate the whole universe and make it alive. So that, the, and that is why we read in Romans chapter 1 that the whole creation is groaning and waiting eagerly for the appearance of the sons of God. Well, we can become sons of God only if we are born of God. And we can be born of God only if we grow in grace and knowledge, led by the Holy Spirit in the meantime while we are still in this flesh. What an exciting, what a wonderful news to know, brethren. What a wonderful and beautiful good news in this dying world. No, there will be no apocalyptic end of this world. God has not created this world to end it. God has created humankind so that he will have a countless number of God member, God members, countless number of members in his family and that he can through that family work tremendous and wonderful eternal glory and give eternal life basically to the whole of universe. We don't have all the details revealed in the Bible, but we do have enough details that we understand that that is what humans have been have been created for and we have enough details to understand again that god is a family a spiritual eternal family that is ready to receive countless 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 new members that will be born into the very god family until next time goodbye friends